those books, uh, Phoenicia, that you read from and the pictures that I saw in, in my office and at the same that Governor Wolf uh, couldn't apparently look at as well, uh, that's not age appropriate. And asking those to be removed is, is not a book ban. That's just madness. That's a logical fallacy. And we have ratings for movies. Obviously, it should be ratings for books. It's common sense. That was the Republican nominee for governor in Pennsylvania, the very right-wing state senator, Doug Mastriano. Earlier this week, he's calling for books to be removed from schools, but says it's not a book ban. If you want to see just how far the hard-right campaign to ban books has gone, just look at one Pennsylvania school district last year that tried to ban a book about Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Who would want to ban a book about Rosa Parks? If anything, there may be too few books about her. And there hasn't even been a feature-length documentary about her life until now. The rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks premiered this week on Peacock from executive producer and veteran journalist Soledad O'Brien. As I sat there and waited to be arrested, didn't know whether I would be manhandled or hurt physically or what would happen. The policeman approached me. He said, why don't you stand up? I said, I don't think I should have to stand up. And I asked him, I said, why do you push us around? He said, I do not know, but the law is the law and you're under arrest. Now, we all know that story of Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus, but the documentary shows how that moment was just one moment in a lifetime of activism for Parks. It's also a timely reminder that we all need to better understand American history, especially black American history. I spoke earlier with Soledad O'Brien about the new documentary, now nominated for a Critics' Choice Award. Soledad O'Brien, thanks so much for joining me on the show. Every child in America learns the same story about Rosa Parks, basically this idea that she was too tired to give up her seat and in that moment became a civil rights icon. Your, document, your documentary takes on that story. How so? Yeah, uh, so the documentary, which was uh, directed by two women, women uh, Yoruba Richin and uh, Johanna Hamilton, uh, is based on a book, which was written by Jean Theo Harris. And so what we wanted to do was follow pretty closely to the book's premise, which was that this concept we have uh, about Rosa Parks is pretty wrong. And I would put myself in with everybody else who felt like, you know, there was a moment in time where one day Mrs. Parks was just tired. In fact, Mrs. Parks' entire history was one one of an activist, a lot of the work that she was doing for the NAACP, yes. even before her work with the NAACP, she was kind of badass in terms of what she did to fight for civil rights. So this idea that just one day her feet hurt and she didn't want to give up her seat is just wrong. And it it frames her as this kind of accidental uh, civil rights you know, activists, I guess, yeah. in the moment when that's just not true at all. And we were very interested in exploring, one, what was her true story? And two, why frame her as accidental? It's a very good uh, point, very good question. I'm glad this documentary addresses that. So, that I've talked before on this show about how, as a country, we sometimes hide the radicalism of people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We try and turn them into, I don't know, cuddly, non-threatening teddy bears. Talk about Rosa Parks and her views of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers, things we don't tend to talk about when we talk about Rosa Parks. Liked them both a lot, along with Dr. King. And I think you're right. There was this concept, and I think there exists a concept that you can't like Dr. King and also like Malcolm X, right? That those two things are not possible simultaneously. When actually Rosa Parks, as much as she has a very sweet, almost angelic smile, was very, very tough. And her whole entire strategy was, how do you bring equal rights and civil rights to people who have been oppressed for a long time? I mean, even when she was a small child, she would watch her grandfather, who basically, you know, slept with a, a gun because he was worried about being attacked by uh, members of the KKK. So we were very interested in exploring why do you simplify? I mean, make simple the story of Rosa Parks when actually her background is very tough and hardcore and very um, complex. Uh, she was a person who really felt that she wanted to see equal rights and civil rights by any means necessary. And that meant supporting Dr. King and also supporting Malcolm X and also supporting the Black Panthers. And that continued. What I found very interesting was this the sense that we have of her kind of ends. Like she sat on the bus, bus boycott ends, 
the end, when actually she and her husband could never get a job in Montgomery after the boycott ended. And so she moves on to Detroit, where she talks very overtly about the racism that she experienced in Detroit and how she was working to fight against that as well. She was she was just very, very in the fight all the time. And I think it does make people comfortable to think of, of civil rights as accidental versus this idea of it was a long, challenging haul. Women were very much at the center of it, and it was something that was fought for uh, very hard. You know, as they were putting Rosa Parks, I mean, memorializing her when she died, that was the same time the Supreme Court was overturning opportunities for people to vote, you know, and literally the left hand is doing this, the right hand is doing this. So I, I think people are comfortable with the narrative, and they don't want to explore or really understand the reality of a person or the entire story. So one of the other big issues uh, with Rosa Parks, with the civil rights movement, is the role of women in general. I want to play a clip from your film about women in the civil rights movement. The March on Washington is one example of how black women are often marginalized in the civil rights movement. If you look at those who spoke, with the exception of Daisy Bates, who only spoke for a few minutes, the entire program was dominated by men. They would have her stand up and wave at people. There's Rosa Parks. You know, she sat down on the bus in Montgomery. Wave at him, Rosa Parks, Mrs. Parks. And she sat down. They never said anything beyond that. So, Lodan, it is fascinating that a movement that was committed to civil rights, equality, fighting discrimination, had so many issues with sexism, misogyny, understandably, given the time, in its own ranks. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's pretty consistent. I think uh, people over time have been going back through history and kind of unearthing all the stories of women who were very important in the civil rights movement, whose work has been kind of ignored, or worse, they've been seen as kind of just you know, behind the important men who were really at the forefront when it's not true. I mean, Rosa Parks worked very closely with Recy Taylor. Recy Taylor was a woman from Alabama who was raped and and was threatened. Uh, the, the men who were white men who raped her said that they would come back and kill her if she ever told anybody. And Rosa Parks goes into Alabama and takes down her story. And Recy Taylor, also a leader in the civil rights movement, right? These are moments that actually spurred on the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks talked about... Um, Emmett Till. And one of the reasons that she sat on the bus was that she was thinking about Emmett Till in that moment, not that her feet hurt. She said, I was no more tired than I was at the end of any other work day. I was tired yes. of being taken advantage of, right? Tired, but not in the way that I think a lot of journalists have come to interpret it. So let me ask you this. How important is your new film at a time when books are being banned, especially books about American history, black history. A Pennsylvania school district tried to ban a number of books on race in America last year, including a children's book called I Am Rosa Parks. Yeah, I've seen um, a couple of notes. We have a, um, a book uh, the same title about uh, around our documentary that's going to schools. And I saw a note that a teacher in Florida had to give away his books because he wasn't allowed to have those books in the classroom. Now, I haven't confirmed that, and I don't know if it's just this one teacher or if it's something bigger than that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very concerning. But at the end of the day, I mean, listen, one of the reasons I like your show and I like you as a journalist is that you're about the truth, right? I think that there's a value in yes. what is the accurate story? What actually happened? It, it actually does matter what the truth of the story is. And I think this is a case where our directors were like, we're going to dig into what is the truth of Rosa Parks' story. This is the first documentary, first full-length documentary on Rosa Parks, which I find crazy. I think that's insane. But her story has never that really is. been told, even though we all feel like we know it, right? We know it, but we don't. Yes. And of course, one of the other themes that runs throughout your documentary is this idea that the press, the media at the time, failed Rosa Parks. Uh, in our current era of rising authoritarianism, fascism, white supremacy, how prepared, how ready do you think our media is, not just for the midterms next month, but for the 2024 presidential election? How many lessons have been learned? 
Oh, you know, I don't think, unfortunately, I wish I could answer this differently. I don't think very ready. I think we see daily ways in which the media is being used as a mouthpiece for people who want to claim something, but then actually never follow through. I'm thinking of the Secret Service agents who claim testimony uh, was wrong and that they were willing to say when, in fact, they really weren't willing at the end of the day to testify. Uh, I think our media has really, political media, fails very frequently in terms of connecting the dots and educating people about what's happening. I mean, it's, it's, I talk about it a lot. And I think Rosa Parks was very frustrated in some ways with the media. If you look at the questions they used to ask her, very similar, right? And they all, even the New York Times, it, it, when, when Rosa Parks died, they, they called her the accidental matriarch and, and she was anything but accidental. And it's, it's just getting it yeah. wrong. It's just clearly getting it wrong. And I, I do worry that we see so many examples day in and day out of just getting it wrong and it's important and it matters. So I hope we fix that. Last question then just on that, in terms of getting it wrong, how much of the problem with our media coverage of this historic and pretty depressing dark moment that we're in as a country. How much of that is to do with the fact that a lot of our media, our press, despite major strides in recent years, is still too white? Yeah, I think it always comes down to who is around the table, not necessarily the anchor table, but who's around the table where decisions are made who can say, I disagree with this framing. I think this is a mistake. I think we should be asking these questions. That's where the real power lies. And so the idea that, you know, something that looks diverse actually may not at the highest levels be diverse. And, and at those highest levels is really where it all starts. So yeah, you might not want to talk about white supremacy if it feels very comfortable to you, if it's something that's not bothering you. I'm always sort of um, frustrated by a lot of the stories around politics that don't focus on human beings and the policies that affect actual people, right? It's it's framed as this game. It sort of doesn't matter. And, and maybe for a lot of people, yes. some of these issues don't matter. But for a lot of people, these issues do matter. And, and I wished political reporters would cover it from the point of view of people whose lives are impacted day in and day out.